All right, so let's have a look at uh, an example now. And it's a famous, well-known example. We're going to consider a unit speed helix. And we're going to consider a rather general one. So beta of S equals A times cosine W S on C, A times sine of W S on C, and B on C times S. So what this is, is a curve that in its XY components is going around a circle of radius A. So here's a circle of radius A in the XY plane. And that's what the X and Y coordinates are doing with respect to some frequency that depends on this W and C constants. And then in the Z direction, we're moving linearly with S. So the Z co coordinate is just increasing linearly. Again, some constants B on C. And the result is that, uh, I guess we start here, and so we're going around spiraling in a steady pace or up the Z axis on a cylinder, the center of the Z axis, radius A, and we're going around that cylinder at steady pace up the cylinder. Okay, we have to adjust the constants to get a unit speed curve, so to figure out how that works, let's calculate T of S, which is uh, beta prime of S, that's going to be our uh, unit uh, tangent vector, hopefully. So the derivative is differentiating with respect to S. So we get a minus A W C comes out front times sine of W S over C and then A W on C times cosine W S on C and just B over C in the Z coordinate. And what is the size of that thing? So the size of b to prime of s, well, that's computed square, which is always easier. So we have to calculate, well, it's this squared plus this squared, and there'll be the sine squares and cos squares will give us a one. So we're gonna get a squared w squared over c squared times one plus b squared over c squared for a total of a w squared plus b squared over C squared. A, B squared. A squared. A squared, thank you. A squared W squared plus B squared all over C squared. Now we want this to be equal to one, and so we can make that happen if C equals, or C squared equals A squared W squared plus B squared. So that's the condition that we're gonna suppose that'll guarantee that we have a unit speed curve. Okay, what do we do next? Well, we differentiate this. So T prime of S, we have to differentiate again with respect to S. So that's the same as beta double prime of S, acceleration. Well, we get another W over C coming out front, so we have minus A W squared over C squared now times cosine W S over C and minus A W squared over C squared times sine of W S over C. And then the third component is now zero. This is then the acceleration and remember that the Curvature is then defined as the size or the length of this acceleration. Okay, well, what's that going to be? Uh, well, here we have a minus a w squared c squared times essentially a cosine and a sine. So the length is really just this, this term here, that's the radius of this circle, because the z component now is zero. 
So the, the K of S is just A W squared over C squared. And that's always positive, or we're assuming our A is, is uh, positive. So it's constant curvature. Right? That's independent of S. Which is only reasonable because the curve looks completely the same from at all points, just rotated and translated. And now we can uh, calculate the, the unit normal. So on our picture, we're at some point uh, S here. We have our, yes, our normal was, our tangent vector was uh, in blue. And our A normal vector is going to be in red, perpendicular to that, and that's obtained by, so n of s is just what we get when we renormalize uh, this thing. So it's t prime of s divided by k of s, just renormalizing it so that it has unit length. So what do we have to do? Well, we just have to divide by this a w squared c squared uh, thing out front, and we'll just get minus cosine W S on C minus sine W S on C and zero. So n note that uh, this thing has zero Z component. So note that This points to the cylinder, uh, to the axis of the cylinder, horizontally. So as we're going up, as we're going up, the spot, the, here's the z-axis. We're going up along some trajectory like this. The, this. This normal vector is always pointing directly towards the, the axis. Okay, it's, it's horizontal. The tangent is not horizontal. The tangent's going up. But the, the normal is always horizontal, pointing directly towards the axis. Of course, this is quite uh, relevant for physics. So if you have a, if you have a, a charged particle, which is, um, if say, uh, suppose you have a charge, uniform charge distribution on this z-axis, okay? And that, that uniform charge, ax, uh, charge distribution is gonna create a force field, which is obviously s symmetric around the axis. And we'll assume it's an infinite axis. Okay, so, there's every, so every point looks exactly the same as every other point. That means that the force of, the, of these charges is going to be always horizontally directly towards the axis. So this is exactly the kind of force field that you could expect from having an uh, infinitely long or very long uh, charged, uniformly charged axis. And so if you have some electron or whatever, it's, it's feeling some, some attraction, so it's, it's, it's moving. This is just the, the motion of, the natural motion of a particle as a result of Newton's laws, because the force is equal to mass times acceleration. This is the acceleration. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a natural motion that you would get if you had such uh, a uniform the charge distribution, and you set a particle mo moving in the right direction. You'd expect it to go in a helical path all by itself. Of course, it does happen in physics quite a lot, so. Okay, the final thing that we need to calculate, the, we have two out of the three, so we've got our unit uh, tangent vector uh, right here, where C is, carefully normalized so that's a unit tangent vector. And now we have our unit normal vector 
And so if we take the cross product of those two, then we can get the binormal vector. So finally, the binormal vector is T of S cross N of S. Okay, so then you can make a calculation. We have formula for T of S, you have the formula for N of S, you can do the cross product. And what you get is B over C sine W S on C minus B over C cosine W S on C and A, W, over C. And if we take the derivative of this, we get B, W, over C squared times cosine W, S, over C. B, W, over C squared times sine of W, S, over C, and zero. And that is minus tau over n. Remember, that's how we defined the, the torsion. Took the derivative of the binormal, and that was a multiple of the normal. And that multiple we called minus the torsion. The minus the sign is there for historical reasons. It also makes the matrix sort of look pretty. You can sort of remember it a little bit easier. K minus K, tau minus tau. Okay, and uh, so we can write down, if we compare this expression for the, with the normal expression, which is right up there, then we can see that therefore tau equals beta B W over C squared. And C squared was uh, this thing here, so this is B W over A squared W squared plus B squared. So it has, actually has a constant torsion as well. So it has constant curvature and torsion. In other words, as time goes by, the curvature has exactly the same value and the torsion has exactly the same value. Okay, the natural question is, well, if you have a constant curvature and torsion, do you necessarily have a helix? Do these two conditions define a helix? Well, I'm just going to state a theorem. It's sometimes called the fundamental theorem of curves. And this was all worked out in the middle of the 19th century, so around the 1850s. Uh, Frenet and Serret both independently wrote, um, gave these equations, and then this fundamental theorem came somewhat later, I think. And then the theorem is that two unit speed curves, let's call them beta and beta bar, with the same curvature and torsion functions K of S and tau of S are congruent. What does that mean? Well, it means that there is a rigid motion, sometimes called an isometry of space that sends one curve to another. So we have some curve 
doing something like this, and another curve, well, the other curve would have to look, you know, might be over in some other, well, okay. they're supposed to be the same curves, but just in different positions. So, you know, if you imagine sort of freezing this, if it's frozen, then these, all these curves are just obtained from rigid motions of the, uh, this curve, as long as I'm not actually moving it. Just translating, rotating. It's obvious that if you, it's obvious that if you, if you perform such an isometry, the curvature and torsion are not going to change. But the theorem says that if you know the curvature and the torsion, then basically you know the curve. It's a little bit like, in, like if you know the derivative of a function, then you know what the function looks like. You can integrate it. This becomes some kind of spatial analog. If you know, you, you need to know a little bit more than just one derivative. You need to know a curvature and a torsion. Then you can recover, you can integrate, at least in practice, in principle, you can integrate to find the, the curve. What does torsion mean? Yeah, okay, so that's why I'm going to just to mention uh, that now, that's a very good question. So what, how do we, should we think about torsion? <coughs> so um, before I answer that, let's, uh, let me also define two other planes. So we have these three vectors, T, uh, say N and B. Okay, let me let me put them like this. Okay, we're, we're kind of looking at them, sort of like that, straight on. So there's T, N, and B forming a orthonormal system, and we've already said that the plane spanned by T and N is the osculating plane. All right. So that's the osculating plane. The plane spanned by N and B has also a natural name. It's the normal plane. That's the easy to see. That's, in fact, the simplest plane to imagine because if there's a tangent vector, then the normal vector and the binormal are both perpendicular to the tangent. So if we just look at those ones, the red ones and green ones in this picture, we're just getting a plane that cuts the curve orthogonally, a normal plane. Okay, and as, as, you, as you go around the, the curve, the, the normal plane is just this one here. Okay. okay, and there's one more. The third one has a fancier name. The, the plane spanned by the tangent and the binormal, third possibility, that's the rectifying plane. All right, so physically, what we'd like to think of we think, think of curvature is like bending while torsion represents twisting. So If we come back to here, if we just just have a look at the at the oscillating plane, the nope, there's our tangent vector at some point and a normal vector. Okay, those two forming the oscillating plane. Okay, so just, just imagine thinking about that plane. What happens to it as as we're moving along? Okay, we're moving along. The the torsion is, is is telling us how much that plane is twisting this way. You know, so if you were on that, pla uh, if you were on that car magic carpet, you know, is, is it going back and forth like this? Or are you going to get knocked off or is it a rather smooth ride? 
If there's a lot of torsion, then it's going to be moving like this sideways. So you're going like this, but at the same time, you're kind of going sideways. Okay. So you're going, you might be going around, that's the, the, you're going around some circles, that's the curvature, but, you, but, you, but you're also sort of being t twisted, that's the torsion. There's a, a, maybe a, a finite version of this, so these days it's quite popular to think about a finite analogs of differential geometry. It's so maybe something we might talk a little bit more about at some later point. So there's um, lots of uh, applications to architecture where people want to create surfaces not with, with some continuous thing, but rather with a rigid series of triangles or quadrilaterals or something like this. Okay? So they want to have sort of analogs of differential geometry ideas, but in a more finite setting. So what might be a finite kind of analog? Well, the most simple kind of thing is just imagine having a sequence of points in space, having a, a discrete path instead of a continuous path. So this, I'm, I'm going to draw in the plane, but you should really think of this as being some dis discrete set of points in space. Okay, so there's a discrete path in space. All right, so what would be the, maybe the, the sort of analogs of, of what we've been talking about? Well, these lines that connect consecutive points, that's naturally like a tangent vector. Right? So you can sort of think of our tangent vectors as roughly being those lines that connect adjacent points. So right here, the tangent vector is the direction you're going in, and then over here, it's changed over here, and so on. Now, if you have three points, so two points form a tangent vector. If you have three points, then you have a little triangle. Okay, so you have a little triangle. Why not, why not let's look at this triangle. Maybe call it something. So let's um, color it there. So that little triangle formed by those three points now has a 